Let's read a little bit about Dr. Seuss. Type the country you're joining from. Who was Dr. Seuss? In 1985, Princeton University awarded honorary degrees to six people. An honorary degree is given to a person who has done something important for the world. The students were excited about one of the people being honored. When a tall, thin, uh, thin man with a gray beard stood up, they all leaped to their feet. I am Sam, they chanted. Sam, I am. Then they recited from memory all of green eggs and ham. It was a special way to show Theodore Giesel, better known as Dr. Seuss, how much this book meant to them, how much his books meant to them. Among the Princeton, Princeton students that year was Michelle Robinson. Many years later, she married Bar Barack Obama and became what... That is crazy, guys. Wait. Among the Princeton students that year was Michelle Robinson. Many years later, she married Barack Obama and became the first lady of the United States. That is crazy. Wow. So, Michelle Robinson, the wife of Barack Obama, was... Uh, a student of Dr. Seuss. That is crazy. That is crazy, guys. Do you know Dr. Seuss? Can you uh, comment if you know Dr. Seuss? Uh, this is a really, really good book to read. Um, the level, it's very simple to understand. So, so yeah. So, in 2010... She chose another Dr. Seuss book, The Cat in the Hat, to read aloud to the nation's school children. The first lady knew that books for beginning readers used to be solemn and boring. Then Dr. Seuss appeared with his bouncy rhymes and wild and crazy characters like The Cat in the Hat, Horton, Grinch, Learning to read was never the same again. Chapter 1. Goofy Machines Theodore Suze Giselle, I guess Giselle, was born in Springfield, Massachusetts on March 2nd, 1904. Springfield was full of factories running our cars guns, bicycles, tires, and toys. One of the factories was a brewery that Ted's grandfather had started called Kalmbosch Col and Giesel. Ted's father became the president of the company. Its beer was so popular that the people of the Springfield nicknamed the business Come Back and Guzzle. So, Ted grew up in a family that loved wordplay. His mother's family owned a bakery. As a child, she made, up the, she made up rhymes, listing the pie flavors. Later, she sang her children to sleep with the same rhymes. Ted believed that his love of verse came from his memories of those pie poems. Really interesting. So, his sister, two years older, was named Margaretha. But she nicknamed herself Marnie. Marnie Mecca Ding Ding Guy. What? <laughs> that is funny. His father, also named Theodor, liked to dream up goofy, complicated, and inventions in his spare time. 
Ted's favorite was silk stocking back seam wrong detecting mirror. Young Ted loved to hang around the zoo. So he loved spending time at the zoo. He got special treatment because his father helped, helped run the zoo. Sometimes he said, they would let me in the cage with the small lions and the small tigers. And I got, I got chewed up every once in a while. He was famous for exaggerating when he told stories. <laughs> so, this is funny. After a visit to the zoo, Ted rush, would rush home and draw animals on the walls of his room. Wow, this is so cool. So he would just get home and draw animals on the walls of his room somehow the animals never ended up looking quite like what he had seen at the zoo so he would make up names for them one of his mother's favorites was a creature with ears that were nine feet long he called it wimp so interesting Like many people in Springfield, the the gazelles, the gazelles, the geysels from Germany. The geysels came from Germany. Ted grew up speaking both German and English. In 1914, World War II started in Europe. Many countries were fighting against Germany. The United States was not in the war yet. That didn't happen until 1917, but Germans were becoming very unpopular in America. At school, German-American children were often bullied. Sometimes kids would throw rocks at Ted. The Geisel, Geisel family tried hard to prove that, uh, you see, this is very sad, this is very sad. To prove what? To prove that they were patriotic Americans. Ted's Boy Scout troop had a contest to see who would sell the most li liberty bonds, a way to help the government support the war effort. Ted's grandfather bought $1,000 worth. This made Ted one of the winners. At the award ceremony, medals were given out by former President Theodore Roosevelt, but someone in the Boy Scouts had made a mistake. There were ten winners, yet Roosevelt had only uh, had only nine medals. When he ran out of medals, Ted was left standing alone on stage. Roosevelt below, bellowed, bellowed. What's this little boy doing here? No one explained that Ted was a winner too. Ted slunk away. From then on, it was very hard for Ted to get up in front of people. Even after he was famous, he refused to give speeches. When he tried to appear on television talk on a television talk show, he was so scared that he couldn't say a word. That is crazy, guys. After the war ended in 1918, Ted's family faced a new problem. In 1920, as 1920 began, Prohibition became the law in the United States. Prohibition meant that it was legal to make or sell alcohol, including beer. The brewery 
had to close, and Ted's father was out of a job. The family still had enough to live on, but the loss of the brewery was a terrible, terrible blow. Now, the family had much less money. Just as Ted was about to graduate from high school, but education was important to the Geisel family. No matter what, they made sure there was enough money for Ted to go to college. Ted had never paid much attention to his schoolwork. He spent most of his time writing jokes for the school paper. The one class that interested him was English. That one class that interested him was English. Prohibition. In 1920, it became illegal to sell or manufacture. Alcohol in the United States. The Eighteenth Amendment, called Prohibition, was passed by activists who thought drinking liquor was ruining people's lives. But Prohibition was not very successful. Crime groups such as the Mafia became more powerful by smuggling liquor. Gangsters like the、uh, Al Capone became folk heroes. Most people kept on drinking, even though it meant they were breaking the law. Many towns had a speakeasy, a place where you could buy alcohol, alcoholic drinks, if you knew the secret password or knock. The amendment was especially hard on people, like the Geisels, Geisels, Geisels. I don't know the correct pronunciation. I need to look it up. But can someone correct me? The amendment was especially hard on people like the Geisel, who had made their living selling alcohol. Ted never forgot what it did to his family. Many of his early cartoons made fun of prohibition. Cities that had been famous for their breweries suddenly lost their most important business, and all the tax money and jobs that went with them.、Uh, yeah, and all the tax money and jobs that went with them. Some breweries tried to survive by selling soda. Other places. Sold grape juice or mob syrup. They included careful instructions, telling their customers exactly what not to do, their juice. To do to their juice or syrup to make sure it didn't turn into alcohol. By the nineteen thirties, it was clear that prohibition was failed, was a failed experiment. In nineteen thirty three, President Franklin Roosevelt. Signed, signed a law that helped end it. Then he said, "I think this would be a good time for a beer." So this is the this is the life of Doctor Seuss. If you've heard of Doctor Seuss, I'm reading about his life and who he was. And his first name was Ted. So Theodore, Theodore. So yeah, Theodore, Theodore, Theodore. Ted's English teacher had gone to Dartmouth, Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. He loved Dartmouth so much that Ted decided to go there too. This is the map. This is Boston over here, New Hampshire, Dartmouth. This is the 
state of Massachusetts. It's close to close to New York for those who are not familiar. New York would be like down here. This is the book that I'm reading. Who was Dr. Seuss? So chapter two, a very fine flying cow. Ted loved Dartmouth. It was located in green countryside with beautiful old buildings. He made friends there who he kept for the rest of his life. Shortly after he arrived, he discovered the school humor magazine, Jack-O-Lantern fondly known as Jacko. It became his dream to work. On Jacko. It became his dream to work on Jacko. And he started spending all his time in the office. Staff members would find him there in the morning fast asleep at his typewriter. He was quickly elected to the staff and at the end of his junior year, he was made editor in chief. The students loved his stories and drawings and uh, he became a very important person at Dartmouth. Even so, his classmates voted, voted him uh, voted, voted him, voted him least likely to succeed. Ted never seemed to be serious about anything. A month before graduation, Ted threw a party. The guests shared a bottle of gin. When a couple of boys began horsing around on the roof, Ted's landlord called the police. Because of prohibition, Gin was illegal, so Ted was in a lot of trouble. He was in a lot of trouble. As punishment, he was not allowed to write for Jacko anymore, but he found a way around this. He signed his work with fake names. He had already used joke names such as Olala, Olala McCarthy, and uh, Theo Lysig? Lys Lysig? Lysig was Giselle spelled backward. So now he started using just his middle name, Seuss. A Dartmouth, Ted had spent all his time on Jacko. His grades were not very good. Ted's father was afraid that he wouldn't be able to get a job after college. But Ted told his dad not to worry. He was going to Oxford, a famous university in England. What's more, he said, he had won a prize to pay for it. I don't know why my accent immediately changed from American to English, British accent as soon as I saw the word England. What's more, he said, he had won a prize to pay for it. His father was so thrilled that he told the local newspaper. The next day, Ted was headline news. But there was a problem. Ted had applied to Oxford, but he didn't really, he hadn't really won any money. He only hoped he would. Ted had to tell his father the truth. The old gazelle was a very proud man. He had already announced to the world that Ted was going to Oxford, so he decided that
that he would pay for his son to go. In the summer of 1925, Ted boarded a steamship for the long journey to England. England. <laughs> I really had fun reading this, so I'm going to continue reading. This was about the childhood of Dr. Seuss. His name was Ted. Here in this part, he is, his father is sending him to Oxford. Ted really never fit in at Oxford. Do you guys know the meaning of the word or the phrase fit in? Fit in. What is fit in? If you don't fit in in a place, what does that mean? He's not very comfortable. Very good job, English learning. He's not supposed to be there. Yeah, like if you say, I don't fit in in this culture, it means you don't feel comfortable. You don't like the culture. Or if you say, I don't fit in with my school or in my school. You don't feel comfortable in that place. Yeah, very good, Gustavo. Good job. Very good job. So he never really fit in at Oxford. And this is the reason. The university was about 800 years old. All the students seemed very serious. So the students were very serious. The lectures bored him. What is the meaning if... What is the meaning of the lecture bored him? The word bored, you know, like if you say something is boring, it's not interesting. But you can also, just like here, you can use it as a verb. If you say the lecture bored him, it means the lectures made him feel bored. It was not interesting. Yeah made him feel sleepy, tired, and he couldn't focus. Ted tried to listen and take notes, but his mind wandered. What is his mind wandered? It means his mind was just thinking about other things. His mind was imagining other things. If you wonder, it means you're just doing things without uh, plans or uh, things are not. Like if you say, I'm just wandering around the city, it means you're going around the city aimlessly without plans, without goals or without aims. So, so if your mind wanders, it means it just has random thoughts. It's different from the other word we have for wonder, which is W-O-N-D-E-R. If you say, I wonder, I wonder if he's okay. It means I'm curious if he's okay. Anyway, back to the lesson. Ted tried to listen and take notes, but his mind wondered. His mind was not there. Instead, he doodled. Okay, this is a good word. Who knows the meaning of the word doodled? What is doodled? Comment the meaning of doodled. What is doodled? And by the way, this is my website. Solo hablo español. En serio? Uh, well, necesitas aprender inglés aquí. 
no idea. So doodle means like if you're just making cartoon, make pictures without sense. Juana, Juana Rosa, very good. Drawing. Yeah, if you're doodling, you're just like making things, drawing pictures or here and there. You're just scribbling, maybe making a house, drawing a house, uh, a chicken, whatever. That's what uh, doodling is. So he was just doodling. Uh, I need to put my Okay, so he just doodled. He was drawing photos. The pages of his notebooks were filled with chickens and windmill trails, dogs walking across tight tropes, and cows with wings. So he was just drawing things, right? He couldn't focus on the class. Helen Palmer... Another American was at Oxford studying to be a teacher. One day, she looked over Ted's shoulder to see what he was drawing. That's a very fine flying cow, she said. Helen told Ted, Ted, his drawings were very special. She said he would be an illust illustrator. Helen's remark, Helen's comment. Remark means comment. Illustrator. Illustrator. What is illustrator? Illustrator means uh, someone who drew, f like, who told a story with pictures. To illustrate means to explain something or to do something with photos. So... Uh, she said he should be an illustrator. Helen's remark changed Ted's life. He realized he didn't want to teach. He didn't want to write novels. He just wanted to keep drawing his mixed up animals. After that, Ted and Helen spend uh, all their time together. One day he proposed. Wow, proposed. What does that mean? One day he proposed and Helen accepted. What is propose? Who knows the meaning of propose? And thank you guys for jo joining. Thank you for liking the video. Please hit continue hitting the like so that other people join and share my video with your friends. So, to propose means usually, well, always, 99% of the time, the man asks uh, the woman to marry him. So, to propose means to say, will you marry me? So, he proposed and Helen accepted. She said yes. But they couldn't get married. Oh, no. That's terrible. Propuso. Yeah, Mariela. Good job. To engage with somebody. Very good. So they didn't have any money. Man, that's terrible. So they couldn't get married. Anyone trying to get married? So yeah, he proposed. She said yes, but 
They didn't have any money. After she graduated from Oxford, Helen took a teaching job in New Jersey. Ted dropped out of school. What is dropping out? Okay, Gustavo is looking. All right. Good, good, good. I hope you'll find what you're looking for, man. So, what is dropping out? Katsuki. I need to learn English. Well, you are learning English here. And make sure that you subscribe to my podcast. You see, I wrote my podcast right here, The English Zone. If you go to Spotify or Apple Podcast or Google Podcast, just type The English Zone and you'll find my podcast. And I have many, many lessons to practice English. So anyway, so they didn't have any money. After she graduated from Oxford, Helen took a teaching job in New Jersey. Ted dropped out of school. Dropped out does not mean kicking out. It means he quit school. He didn't finish school. He didn't want to finish school. Yeah, very good, Gustavo. So yeah, he dropped out of school and moved back in moved back in with his parents in Springfield, Massachusetts. Massachusetts is a state in the U.S. in northwest of the United States. It's near New York. It's near New York. Okay? So, that part of the state. Anyway. So, he knew what he wanted to do with his life. Now he just had to figure out how to find a solution how to make a living from his drawings because he loved drawing. He loved drawing pictures. So now he had to figure out, he had to find how to make money. To make a living means to make money, to have a job that provides you enough money to for your life. Yeah. So... He had to figure out a way to make money, to make a living with his drawings. And here we are, chapter three. Thank you guys for joining and thank you for liking and sharing the, the video. Um, thank you for your gifts. Thank you, Irma, for the flowers. I appreciate it. So, so yeah, so, so what happened was Helen finished school, graduated from Oxford. She got a job in New Jersey and Ted dropped out of school and moved back in with his parents in Springfield, Massachusetts. New Jersey, New Jersey and Massachusetts are not very far maybe like five hours drive. So, so yeah. Do you think they stayed together? What do you think? Do you think in, in the next chapter they're going to talk about this? Do you think Helen and Ted will get married or they will not talk anymore? Wow, we have someone living in Massachusetts. What part? I live in Ma Massachusetts. So Wad says they they get married. Someone says they not they don't get married. What is figure? Figure together with out, figure out means to find an idea, to find a solution. Uh, this is called phrasal verb. This is a phrasal verb. Figure and out together have a different meaning. So to figure out means to find a way, to find a solution. Very good, Wat Faisal. Greetings from Colombia. They will luckily get married. Okay. 
Let's see. Yeah, so if you say, I have a problem, I want to figure out how to fix my car. It means I want to find a way to fix my car. So yeah, thank you for your, oh, that is, that is a good question, to move back. Move back, this is actually, I made a video about this. If you check my TikTok, I made a, a TikTok video about the meaning of move back because move back is also a phrasal verb. Move back is a phrasal verb and phrasal verbs are very, very important in English. To move back means to go back and live in the place where you lived before. To live in a place that you used to live before. It's so crazy, guys. You see, I'm telling you, phrasal verbs are so important because literally just in, in this paragraph, drop, dropped out, move back, figure out. You see, all of these are fra phrasal verbs. And if you don't understand the phrasal verb together, you will not understand the meaning because drop, the word drop is different. Like this is drop. You drop something, right? But drop out is different. To drop out means to quit school, to quit college, to stop school or stop college. Move by itself, it just means like, you know, you move something. But move back means you, uh, you return, you go back to a place where you used to live. That's what it means. So, again, those are three important phrasal verbs right here. If you look at my YouTube channel, if you go to the, the link is in my bio, but if you go to my YouTube channel, you will see a playlist. I made a lot of videos about phrasal verbs and you will learn a lot of them. So yeah, check out my YouTube channel, The English Zone. The link is in bio. I made a lot of videos about phrasal verbs like for get, like if you say get off, get in, get out get on, get over, get through. You see, all of these are different meanings. So, so yeah. So let's find out if Helen and... <laughs> Wait, somebody said something. All this phrase verb, phrasal verbs are s set back for him. <laughs> okay. Well, let's find out. Wait, Bostonian. Are you Bostonian? You're from Boston? We're talking about Massachusetts right here. How far is Springfield from Boston, Massachusetts? So let's find out what happens with, with this Ted boy. Chapter 3, Boyds and Beasties. Boyds and Beasties. Back at his parents' house, Ted spent his time drawing cartoons and writing funny articles. Writing funny articles. Okay. Thank you guys for your gifts and for, I guess, subscribing. I don't know that heart thing, but I think it's subscribing. But if you're subscribing, thank you for doing that. Um, but, uh, anyway, thank you for your gift, Tarot. So, he spent his time drawing cartoons and writing funny articles. He sent them to everyone he could think of. Magazines in New York, college friends, advertising agencies, so he was hustling, but no one except Helen seemed to be interested in flying cows and dancing dogs. <laughs> That's real love right there. That's real love right there because she 
believed in him. No one else believed in his stories. But Helen was interested in the stories that he was writing. Then a famous magazine, the Saturday Evening Post, accepted a cartoon. Ted had drawn two elegant tourists with parasols. Elegant tourists. They were sitting on tame camels and imagining that they were brave explorers. He signed it simply, Seuss. So he signed it like he signed the paper. He signed the uh, the cartoon, and he wrote Seuss. The post paid him $25. Paid him $25. That is amazing. So they paid him $25. And in 1930s, $25 was a lot of money. No, move back does not mean back off. Move back means uh, go back to your hometown and live there. Maybe you go to a different city and you study and then and then after college you move back. So you move back means you go back to your parents house or your hometown. So yeah, anyway. So the post paid him $25. So even in 1925, oh, my bad. I thought that was a lot of money, but it wasn't. Even in 1925, that wasn't a lot of money, but it would pay for a month's rent. Ted decided, John, $25 was 400 worth $400 today. How do how do you know? That is that's that's some knowledge right there. You just unlocked. Okay. So, but he decided it was enough. It was enough to show he could earn a living as an illustrator. Again, earn a living means make money. He moved to New York City, but until he had a steady income, steady income means consistent salary. A steady income means regular income, regular salary. And earn means make money. So, he still couldn't marry Helen. Man. The guy is determined. He is really focused on Helen. He's like, I'm going to marry this girl. I still don't have money. I know I only have $25. I make only $25. Still can't marry her, marry her because no cash. I ain't got, I ain't got no cash. But instead, Ted shared, shared an apartment with a friend for, from Dartmouth. It was cheap. It was cheap um, and dirty. Every night before they went to bed, they had to take canes, whack away the rats. Wow. So they had to kick, kick, uh, like clean the place from rats. You see? So they had to like, catch the rats and kick them out. The situation was not easy. It was, it was tough, but I think he wanted to save money. So, so yeah. To whack away the rats. Whack away means like to throw them away or it was whack. I don't know exactly what it means, but 
Did they live in New York? Yes. And there are a lot of rats in New York. There are around, I think, maybe back back in the day, there were less. <laughs> but now it's uh, maybe two million, two million rats in the city. So, yeah. So he had to, they have to do this, but it was cheap. So Ted's roommate knew someone who worked for a humor magazine called Judge. He introduced Ted and the magazine offered him a job. He would be a writer, an artist, and earn a salary. Wow, you guys. Congratulations. Sir. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Send some likes to Dr. Sue. Yeah. So that's a big, big, big transformation because he got a job. He will be he would be a writer, an artist, and he will make money. He would make a living. So, yay, now they're getting married, guys. This is, this is good stuff. His life is turning around. Big things. Big things is happening. Big things are happening. Now, he and Helen could marry. They had to change the date of their wedding once. They had to change the date of their wedding once because Ted's sister, Marnie, was about to give birth. Ted wanted his whole family to be able to come to his wedding. Thank you, Sergio. I appreciate it. Ted's niece, Peggy, was born on November 1st, 1927. On November 29, Ted and Helen were married in her parents' parlor. There you go. Wow! <laughs> this is good stuff. Very happy for them. Are you guys happy? How do you... Can you type a comment to congratulate the couple on their wedding? Or on their marriage. Yeah. Somebody said. Yeah. Runisha said congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations Dr. Seuss. You guys look very cute together. Congratulations Seuss. So yeah. What is the name of the book? Dr. Seuss. So, wow, all right. So Ta Ted became very popular at Judge. He started writing a column called Boyds and Beasties, where he could introduce all his strange, playful creatures. He signed the column Dr. Seuss. He added the doctor because he had disappointed his father by dropping out of Oxford. Wow. So he felt bad. He felt bad that he disappointed his parents or his father by quitting Oxford. So now he's calling himself Dr. Seuss. Thank you for your gifts, you guys. Unfortunately, Judge Magazine was having money troubles. They didn't always have enough cash to pay their staff. Companies paid for ads to ju in Judge, paid for ads in Judge with samples of their products instead of money. These samples got, pa got 
passed on to the staff as their salaries. Often, Ted was paid in cases of shaving cream or soda. Once, he received 1,872 nail clippers. <laughs> this is crazy. So this was his salary one time. Nail clippers. That wasn't much help in paying the costs of everyday life. Then in 1928, he had a stroke of luck. He had a, something lucky happened. It started with Flit, a popular butt killer. Before air conditioning, people had to leave their windows open in the summer to let in cool breezes. Houses became full of bugs. Ted started thinking about how awful summer must have been for the nights of old. It was bad enough having bugs inside. What if dragons could fly in and bite you? He drew a carton, sorry, he drew a cartoon knowing showing a knight in armor who can't get to sleep because there's a dragon in his room. The caption says, darn it all, another dragon. And just after I'd sprayed the whole castle with flit. The wife of an advertising executive for flit was at a beauty salon where she, she happened to see the cartoon in a, in a magazine. She loved it so much. She made her husband hire Ted to do all the flit ads. You see, sometimes, honestly, you have to continuously work hard. If you have a dream, you have to continuously work hard. And sometimes things work out in a funny way. Or maybe some people are just lucky. But the truth is, you have to continue working. Because the more you work towards your goal, um, the more... Luck, I would say, you create, but also the more opportunities may open up. That's that's what I think. My name is Karen from Peru. Thank you for joining, Karen, and thank you for ch sharing my video. Thank you for your gifts and for your likes. Yeah. Falo inglés más to amando aprender a pronuncia. Yeah. Perfect. All right, so so yeah, she loved it. She made her husband hire Ted to do all the flit ads. Ted drew people in funny situations being attacked by huge bugs. This became one of the most successful advertising campaigns in history. Today, few people remember the tagline Ted invents and Ted invented Quick Henry the Flit. But from the late 20s to the 50s, everyone knew it. Comedians quoted it, and it appeared in popular songs. Sales of Flit shot way up. And Dr. Seuss's, Dr. Seuss's drawings became famous. Whoa. Okay, this is huge. This is huge, guys. So Flit, the magazine, I guess, hired Ted at a salary of $12,000 a year. A lot of money at the time. Probably more than a million. A million a year. The next year, the stock market crashed and America plunged into the Great Depression. This is... Very interesting. So here, Abdurrahman Umar, the name of the book is Dr. Seuss. Who was Dr. Seuss? Who knows about the Great Depression? Does anyone know? See, the next year, the stock market crashed. The America plunged into the Great Depression. All over the country, people were out of work, poor, and starving. But thanks to Flit... Ted had plenty of money. Yes, very good. 
and Fabian, the economy crisis. Yes, the economic crisis. When the country goes through inflammation and uh, basically the country goes broke. With his new wealth, with his new money, he and Helen began throwing parties. They had a very active social life. And Ted became famous in their circle of friends for his practical jokes. Once, he sneaked... He sneaked what? He sneaked into the kitchen and put a huge plastic pearl in one of the oysters that was going to be served at dinner. Another time, he filled a friend's bathtub with jello and goldfish. <laughs> That's funny. Very funny. Thank you guys for joining. Uh, this is the book that I'm reading. I hope you're having a good time. You're learning a lot. And by the way, I will be posting this on YouTube. So make sure that you subscribe to my YouTube channel. So in 1931, Ted's mother died at the age of 52. Her early death was a shock to Ted. But at least she had lived long enough to see his first big success. Flit made Ted financially secure for life. But there was one problem. He didn't want to spend all his time drawing Flit ads but his contract wouldn't let him do most other kinds of work. Years later, he wrote, I would like to say I went into children's book, book, book work because of my great understanding of children. But it, it wasn't really true. Actually, illustrating children's books was one of the few things his contract let him do. The Geisels, I don't know how his family's name pronounced, but the, the Gisels, Gisels, Geisels. Uh, does anyone know how this is pronounced? I don't know. The, so the Geisels' first apartment in Manhattan was right across the street from Horse Stable. Horse Stable. Soon they moved to a better apartment. Their new phone number was only one digit different from a nearby fish store. They often got telephone calls from people who wanted to buy fish. Instead of telling them they had the wrong number, Ted would draw a picture of the fish they had ordered and delivered it. <laughs> this is funny. So... <laughs> If they call, they say, hey, I want a fish. Instead of telling them they had the wrong number, Ted would draw a picture of the fish they had ordered and delivered it. Not everyone was, was amused at the time. Amused means happy. They were not like, oh my God, this is so funny. But just think what those drawings would be worth today. Right? Imagine Dr. Seuss drawing this. Right? So. So, yeah. Amazing. Chapter 4. Should I keep reading? Should I keep reading? Oh, 
All right. Well, we're going to keep reading then. So, what I saw on Mulberry Street, what I saw on Mulberry Street, an editor at Viking Books saw the Flint advertisements and hired Ted to illustrate a book of mistakes made by school children. So, Ted found himself drawing pictures for silly quotations like Benjamin Franklin produced electricity by rubbing cats backward. The book was published in 1931. To Ted's surprise, it became a big hit. Do you guys know the meaning of a big hit? What is a big hit? If something becomes a big hit, what does that mean? A big hit. Yeah, very good. Bestseller. Not pepino, not, not damage. Success. Big success, yes. So... Like, you can use it for movies, for songs, for music, for books. If something is a big hit, it means it becomes very, very popular and it makes a lot of money and obviously success. So, it was a big hit, a big hit. And so, Vikings signed him. Thank you, Sinatur, for your gifts. I appreciate that. That's very kind of you. So, Viking signed him. Up to do, and so, signed him up to do a sequel. What is a sequel? Wow, thank you, Sinatur. I appreciate it. It's very nice of you. So, a sequel means to do another one, a continuous book of that. Oh, a continuous, like, story. One, like, the second part, you know? That is a sequel. You can use sequel for movies, too. You know, like, uh, Fast, for, uh, Fast and Furious, and then a sequel. Or... Uh, Breaking Bad TV show and then there was a sequel which was like oh actually that was that is called spin-off but a sequel means another part yeah Flit is the name of the company so yeah we're just about to hit uh half of the the goal we have 20,000 likes wow thank you guys that is amazing i appreciate the support and we have 500 people here from so many different countries this is absolutely amazing and i appreciate uh, all the support this is very nice i love it wow senator that is that is amazing. We are almost. I don't know. I don't. I don't even. I stop counting. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. So. So Ted soon realized that he would make more money if he wrote and illustrated his own books. He began looking for the perfect subject. For his first book. We achieved the goal. Wow. Thank you guys. I appreciate the the support and big support big big hug for whoever that person was who did all the amazing sent all the amazing gifts. So we're going again. So yeah, 
he's like, I want to do my own thing. He's he's working for different different magazines, different companies, and now he says, I want to write my own book. In 1936, Ted and Helen took a trip to Europe. On the ship, on the ship ride home, he scribbled picture book ideas in his notebook. Ideas like a stupid horse and wagon. A flying cat pulling Viking ship. Nothing seemed quite right. Nothing seemed like, oh my God, this is an amazing idea. But this is, this is the, the amazing thing about thinking about different ideas. Always thinking, thinking about ideas that you have and just continuously like brainstorming, brainstorming, thinking of different things. So he's just writing, even though none of the ideas seem like, oh my God, this is a great idea. Meanwhile, the throbbing noise of the ship's engines was driving him crazy. So the engine was making a lot of noise and it was driving him crazy. He started fitting words to it. Suddenly, he found himself chanting, and that is a story that no one can beat. And that's a story that no one can beat. And that's a story that no one can beat. And to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street. And that's a story that no one can beat. And to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street. So he's just chanting. What is the meaning of chant? Chanting means to repeat something. Repeat something over and over again, and like it has a beat to it. That is chanting. So he's like, That's a story that no one can beat. And to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street. I don't know if that's the right chant, but repeating something, right? So that's that's what he was doing. Thank you, Santur, for all the gifts. Amazing really appreciate it i hope you're learning a lot from my uh from my reading i hope you guys are all learning a lot continue sh sharing and liking the video so other people join this is amazing by the way guys this is true love right here this is real love right here you know so yeah because she really believed believed in him from the beginning. And there was his story. A little boy walking home on Mulberry Street. A main street in Ted's hometown. Looks for something interesting to tell his father about. All he can see is a plain horse and wagon. But by the time he reaches his house, he has turned the horse and wagon into a whole circus parade with blue elephants and a brass, brass band. All the rhymes in Dr. Seuss's books bounce along so naturally that people think they must have been easy to write. But Ted worked hard. I know my stuff looks like it was all rattled off in 28 seconds, he complained. But every word is a struggle. You see, guys, nothing in life is easy. People think, you know, someone is successful, right? Like a, an actor or an author or, um, a, you know, someone successful you see on social media. You just think, oh, yeah, their life is so easy. He's so rich. But you don't see all the struggle they go through, all the sleepless nights, the stress, the disappointment 
feeling like giving up. People don't see that. Oh, they're just so lucky. Come on, right? Nothing in life is easy. If you have a dream, you got to protect it. But you also have to understand that it's not going to be easy. And you don't have to explain yourself to other people. Don't, don't tell them what you're going to do, but also don't share your plan. This is something people don't understand. They post every move they make on social media. Oh, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. I'll tell you, that's a very, very bad move. Because people usually don't like it when you're successful. Or they don't, I mean, it's not, not they, they hate it. They just maybe, um, I don't know. You just have to keep it for yourself. This is the first thing. Second, it's not easy. You know? For one picture, for one picture book, he might write and tear up 500 or even 1,000 pages. This also makes me think of, yes, they are jealous. People are definitely jealous by nature. Um, not everyone. There are. You only need to share your plan and your success and your with people who also listen to your struggles. This is this is what I was thinking about. Struggle means problems, Alex. Struggle means like obstacles, problems you face in life that is not easy. That is the meaning of. And tear up. Tear up means like. Okay, I'm going to have to explain this. Give me one second. So the meaning of tear up is this. Like you write something, you're like, ah, this is so bad. So, And then you write again. So that's tear up, tear up, tear up. So for, for every picture, he would draw 500 times right or even a 1000 pages he would write 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 yeah i mean it's right here <laughs> right because it's not easy it's not easy life is not easy but it's worth it when you are following a dream you are on a mission with a purpose that you know it is it makes you happy it also makes other people happy so what i was trying to say was that when i was saying don't share your struggle or don't share your success only share your success with with people who are happy to see you successful who also listen to you when you are having struggles when you are sad and they believe in you but you tell them and they listen to you that's it keep your plans for yourself so wow thank you lucas for your gifts i see you i see you finally ted was happy with and to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street. So this was the title of his own uh, picture book or storybook. He started sending it to publishers. There you go. They all rejected it. Everyone rejected. Everyone rejected his story. 
even though he was so excited about it. He's like, man, this is going to be good because I love it and it's going to be good. Most editors found it just too different, right? They thought the verse was rough and silly. Worst of all, it didn't have a moral. So he didn't have like an ending. Oh my God, the ending is so amazing. The end lesson, like what lesson are we learning? It wouldn't help make children behave better. What's wrong with kids having fun reading without being priesthood? So Ted yelled. He's like, what's wrong? Like you can have fun without thinking, oh, I'm teaching you a lesson, right? Ted was about to give up when he ran into another Dartmouth friend, Marshall McClintock. Marshall McClintock had just that day become the children's book editor for Vanguard Press. Vanguard often published books that were different. So see, he's getting lucky again, right? He's getting lucky again. They were delighted. They were very happy with the book and immediately they said yes. Ted was so grateful. Thank you very much, sir. He named the hero in the book, Marco, after McClintock's son. So you see, he honored the people who helped him. He didn't ignore or he didn't think this was his success because because without this friend's help he wouldn't have been able to do this so now he's honoring the hero in the book marco after the guy's son who accepted the book or to publish the book there you go guys we're on page 40. Wow, this was such an amazing read. And we are on chapter 5. 